Welcome to Inside Out. Today, we are talking about product discovery. Uh, it's the beginning of the product development life cycle and perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of developing a new product. It's going through and finding what the actual problem is that you want to solve and figuring out how you're going to solve it, uh, which inevitably means you have to talk to customers, which is why it is so close to our heart here at Dovetail. Um, now, talking to customers is uh, obviously a fantastic thing to do. However, most people that we know at Dovetail uh, have told us that it is hard to talk to a lot of customers and it takes a long time and it's very time consuming. And it's part of the reason why our product is all about trying to make that more efficient and effective. Uh, in another way, uh, our guest today, Teresa Torres, product coach and author of Continuous Discovery Habits, is also about making product discovery more efficient and effective. And uh, that is what we're going to be talking about today. And what I really like about Teresa is uh, she's a very hands-on person. And I think that the title uh, thought leader is perhaps not something that uh, you probably claim too much. Uh, is that what, what would you say, Teresa? I think nobody should give that title to themselves. That's for the <laughs> audience to decide, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, I've always, uh, I've liked your hands-on approach. I, I know a lot about, you know, your past, you know, coming from um, very executional roles and then moving into an executive role and then deciding, you know, really where you want to be is helping helping teams get better at things like product discovery. Um, so why don't we get started? And would you be able to give us a quick overview of what continuous discovery, what a continuous discovery team does week over week? Yeah, this is a big question, but it doesn't have to be. So I think one of the things that I really like to do is discovery can be messy, right? Any research is messy. There's lots of twists and turns. We don't. We might start at point A thinking we're going to get to point B, and we might even get to point B, but we might take 17 left turns on the way there, right? And so one of the things that I like to do is I like to add some structure to a messy process. How do we know we're going in the right direction? How do we keep B in our sights? Um, and I look at this as there's three primary components. And then there's lots of tactics within those components. But the three primary components are we have to know where we're going, right? So we have to have an outcome in mind. What, what are we trying to accomplish as a team? Hopefully that outcome is something that measures impact and not just an output, right? We're trying to accomplish this thing that has this impact on our customers' lives in a way that also impacts our business. Uh, the second thing is we have to discover what our customers need. And I tend to use this phrase, um, needs, pain points, and desires, and then I collectively call them opportunities. So why is it more complicated than it needs to be? It's because uh, it's easy as product people to fall into the trap of we're just solving problems. Uh, but I personally use a lot of products that don't solve problems. In fact, they arguably create problems for me. And that's because they satisfy desires. Right, I'm an avid mountain biker. I love my mountain bike. You can't pry it out of my hands. It's not really solving a problem. Maybe it's helping me get more fit, uh, but I would argue doing it that at the gym is probably safer, right? So we see this across the product realm. Needs, pain points, and desires. We often overlook desires. Um, and then the third thing that we need to do in discovery is we need to discover what are the solutions that address those opportunities. And this is the piece that I think like a lot of teams hyper-focus on. We live in solution world, but I think the real power is how do we create a really close match between solutions and opportunities? So then you asked, what am I, what is a continuous discovery team doing week over week? They're always keeping the outcome in mind. I like to use customer interviews as a way to uncover unmet needs, pain points, and desires, or to discover opportunities. And I like to use assumption testing to evaluate solutions, and more importantly, to evaluate the match between a solution and an opportunity. Um, so for me, week over week, I'm probably uh, doing a couple interviews, and I'm probably doing a lot of assumption testing. Right. So a, a regular week for a continuous discovery team uh, is uh, interviews, some interviews, and then assumption testing. And we're going to dive into what those things actually mean. Um, let's start with interviewing. So the whole continuous discovery process uh, is about surprise, surprise, being continuous and building another surprise, a habit. Yeah. Uh, so why interview every week? Uh, why can't teams just talk to customers when they have research questions, you know, a project-based approach? Yeah. 
Uh, so first of all, if we're talking about product teams, and by product teams, I typically mean product managers, designers, software um, engineers, the people building the product. Uh, we tend to, we don't have time. Like when we have a question, when we have a research question, we don't really have time to ramp up and go recruit someone and find someone to talk to. I mean, we should in the ideal world, but we don't. And so if we wait until we have a question to think about who we should interview, uh, we're not going to do it. Now, there's other teams, like if our company has a centralized user research team, they have more time. They're not on this continuous shipping cadence. Um, they have more time to sort of set up a research project, recruit participants, interview around a single topic, come up with a research report, synthesize it, and then communicate it out. That's very different. So when we talk about continuous discovery, we're talking about the teams that are building the products. And sometimes those teams have researchers embedded, but typically... Uh, they don't, in my experience. It's very rare, right? And so we're talking about the teams that are building the product. We want them to have a feedback loop as they make decisions about what to build. So if I'm waiting until I hit the moment where I need feedback, I'm just not going to do it. I have engineers waiting, right? I have a meeting to go to where I'm telling them where I am in the roadmap. Like I don't have time to say, let's stop and recruit. So part of the idea with continuous interviewing is I want a conversation on the books every week, no matter what, so that I always have an opportunity to get some fast answers to my daily questions. But more importantly, I'm also always investing in my understanding of my customers. I'm always spending time. And I think this part is the part that's really undervalued. I could just assume a lot of things about my customers. I spend all day working on my product. I know it inside and out. It's really easy to start assuming my customers know it inside out and they think just like me. Whereas if I just have a simple conversation with my with a customer every week, I start to see, oh, you're not that familiar with generative AI. Oh, you don't really use four different browsers. Interesting, you're not like me at all, right? And so it's good to have those regular reminders. Um, it sounds silly because like, of course you can think your way through like, I'm more technical than my customer and that means this. But like, I had a conversation with an early employee who was not technical at all. She was an admin. And I remember she asked me, she said, Teresa, how do you put those clickable words in your email? And I was like, what? She didn't know what a link was. She didn't know how to create a link. She'd never, like, she'd seen links, but she, right? This is what we need. We need regular reminders that those of us who build technology are not normal. Right? So we need regular exposure to normal people so that we make better decisions about what we're building. A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I just want to unpack a few things, especially around, um, you know, the product teams focusing on this continuous cadence. And I know that we've got a lot of researchers in the audience. And I suppose they would be asking, you know, is it is continuous discovery a replacement for project-based research? Uh, can they can they coexist? Is this an internecine feud? Is this a hostile takeover? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you read LinkedIn, it sounds like a hostile takeover, but don't believe what you read on social media. I don't think that continuous discovery or teams doing their own discovery replaces good research done by skilled researchers. I'm going to say that again, because I'm getting criticized by a lot of user researchers that I'm not vocal enough about this. Continuous discovery, product discovery, product teams talking to customers does not replace skilled researchers doing good research. I think there's some overlap in what we do, but I also think we do fundamentally different things. Here's what a product team is never going to do. They're never going to do a longitudinal study. Never. A product team will never have time to do that. Uh, they probably will never, a product team will probably never do a very rigorous, diligent pricing study. Who has time for that on a product team, right? Um, we're probably not going to do research on what our, um, what prospects think of our competitors' products, right? I could generate a hundred things. Like there's a million research questions that are not appropriate for a product team that companies need answers to. And so, yes, do we still need user researchers? Absolutely. Now, the question is, does that mean user researchers only work on project-based research? Not necessarily. So I think project-based research squarely fits in the realm of user researchers because product teams simply don't have time. I think there's some research-like activities that squarely fits in the product team's realm 
that maybe user researchers don't need to be involved in. I think this is where I'm gonna get myself into trouble, but there's lots of gray area here. So I think that there's things like really simple assumption tests. I'm gonna launch a one question survey to just test a quick assumption I have. I probably don't need a user researcher to help with that activity. I'm gonna go have a conversation with a customer who I know uses this feature to just learn a little bit more about how they use that feature. I probably don't need a user researcher. Now where it gets messy is there's a whole lot of gray area in between, right? I've seen researchers embedded on product teams and they're doing day-to-day -day discovery with their product manager and their designer and their engineer, and it's amazing. It means all of that discovery work is getting the benefit of a skilled engineer, I mean, a skilled researcher. I've seen uh, researchers support multiple teams, in which case they're doing project-based research, they're helping with the most critical discovery questions, and I've seen everything in between. So I don't think there's a right answer here. What I do think is researchers are not going away. Skilled research is still something businesses will need. Um, but I think that each company has to decide how many researchers are they gonna hire? What role are they gonna play? I think each researcher has to decide, am I more interested in project-based research? Am I more interested in day-to-day -day product discovery research? Do I wanna do a mix of both? And then we got to make sure the researcher is matched to the right team and the right company in the right context. Ever the pragmatist. Um, and I think that's <laughs> what gets you in trouble, perhaps just a little bit too honest there. But the reality yeah. is, this is the reality that I've heard time and time again from researchers themselves, which is there are always far more research questions than there are researchers on hand to answer them. So I think as long as that's the case, we are always going to be in a position where other roles like product management are going to have to take up the slack. I mean, like you said, they simply cannot wait uh, for these answers. And if we're going to develop and deliver good products that solve real problems for customers, then inevitably, product managers are going to have to talk to customers. And I think that's fine. And I think having a structure around it like continuous discovery is probably one of the best ways for them to get effective answers. Um, so just back to the idea of the, so we were talking about continuous interviewing. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about uh, product teams, which are obviously, you know, involve product managers, designers, engineers, sometimes uh, UX researchers. Um, why? So they they're interviewing every week. But what is the goal of each interview? Um, can we really get value from one interview each week? Yes, because we're our goal. We're not starting with a research question where we need to talk to a lot of people and look for patterns and identify themes. These types of interviews are very different than I think what a typical researcher would do in a project-based world. I think um, the goal of the interview, think about it as we're just trying to build empathy. We're exp exp uh, increasing exposure, increasing contact. So we see some companies do this by having everybody in the company um, do support for a day a week or do support for a couple of weeks when they get on board. That's great, but support is only one view into your customers. Right? It's it's a first of all, it's a view into a customer that's having a problem, which is great. We should learn that. Um, but we don't always with support get the bigger context. Uh, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? How does our product fit in your life? Um, show me what you do. Now I realize a lot of these things are things that we can learn from project-based research. And when we have that available to us, that's great. But I also think product teams, product managers, designers, software engineers need to be constantly exposed to who their customers are, the context in which their products are being used, what they're trying to accomplish. And it's not because we're very, we're doing um, research with this goal of like coming up with an answer. It's just about adding, it's like putting money in the bank. We're learning more and more context about our customers. So that as we make decisions about what to build, we have all of that context to draw from. Yes, and I think when we move on to the assumption testing part of uh, of this discussion, I, I, that that uh, it plays an integral part in the kind of goal every week as well, right, Teresa? Yeah. So here's the I I, I teach teams one style of interviewing. So this came up. I was doing an event yesterday, and someone asked, like, if we teach our product teams how to do interviews and run experiments themselves, are we replacing user researchers? Well, if you're a user researcher and you only know how to do one type of interview, maybe, but most re user researchers know how to design all sorts of question, interview questions based on the research question, right? That's what researchers do. What I teach product teams is not how to do all sorts of user research interviews to answer a wide variety of 
of uh, research questions, I'm teaching them how to do one thing. You're starting with an outcome. I want to learn the context in which that outcome matters. So if I'm working at Netflix and I'm trying to increase viewing engagement, I want to know what role does Netflix uh, fit in your life? When do you watch it? Where? I can literally teach a product team to ask in every single interview, just tell me about the last time you watched Netflix. Is that always the right question for every research question? No. Is that a great question for a product team just trying to learn about how a product fits in their customers' lives? Yes, right? Now I can play with that. If I'm on the search team, I can say, tell me about the last time you chose a new show. If I'm on the mobile team, I can say, tell me about the last time you watched Netflix on the go. But this isn't rocket science, right? It's how do I just get a little bit of exposure in a reliable way, methods absolutely matter, but how do I get a little bit of exposure so I can learn from my customer and I can um, build my knowledge bank of how they're not me. See, last time we chatted, you you referred to yourself as an empiricist. Is this something that you sort of, and this kind of links back into the way that you think about how product teams approach questions like this. Um, is that still something that you you think? Yeah, I, t to some degree, here's what I'll say. I think that product teams in particular are trying to change behavior. So the primary thing we need to learn about is actual behavior. And this is why I really like story-based interviewing. Tell me what you actually did. If we can pair that with show me with what you actually did, even better, right? Now there's other kinds of research, what you think matters, what you feel matters. But for a product team who just needs to learn very specific ways to keep exposure to a customer, I think we can focus on behavior. Tell me what you did. Because that's gonna get you 90% of what you need for those teeny tiny questions you're trying to answer every day. And we can rely on our user researchers to fill the gaps around feelings and sentiment and um, everything else. And like why what you told me is different from what you did, right? Like there's all what your views of the future are. Are you gonna cancel your cable account? I'm gonna leave all that to my user researcher. What I wanna know is, Okay, you're sitting in your living room and you turn on your TV. Tell me about your experience, right? And I think we can teach product teams to do that. And I've seen it for years now. It unlocks so much more context for teams and they end up making much better product decisions. So um, let's talk about recruitment and participant recruitment because obviously this is something that can take a long time um, and it ends up being quite a big blocker and there's actually several products just the created the whole cottage industry around yeah. just making making sure you can get the right participants. So uh, how do you find customers to talk to every week? So again, this is going to differ from a research project. In a research project, I'm really concerned about variation and sampling and are you an outlier? Uh, if I'm on a product team, ideally I care about those things, but I don't really have the luxury of caring about those things on day one. Now by day 10, I do care. So let me talk through this before I lose all the researchers in the room. Uh, if you have never talked, if you're a product manager and you have literally never talked to a customer, I want you to talk to whoever will talk to you. And I've seen this over and over again. Something magical happens when you talk to your first customer. And I see a lot of teams delay and delay and delay because it's not perfect. It's not the exact right customer. I don't care if you talk to somebody in your family who matches your customer, if it's the first customer you've ever talked to, right? Because people think they know so much about their customer and then they have first contact with just another human that's not them and their mind is blown. So I wanna get to that moment as quickly as possible. And if they turn out, which is not likely, but if they turn out to be a weirdo random outlier, that's gonna come out in conversation number two. And now I might not know who's the outlier, which means I'm gonna do conversation number three, right? And so once a team starts talking to customers on a regular basis, now I want them to think about, are we talking to people in the same region? Are we only talking to people that are super engaged? Are we only talking to people who raise their hand and say, talk to me? And we can start to look at how do we recruit for more variation? Are we gonna to get to a statistical sample? Hopefully I don't have to tell a room full of user researchers that with qualitative research, statistical samples don't aren't relevant. Um, do I need variation? Yes. Do I need to make sure that I'm talking to the right types of people? Yes. What's great is we have amazing tools that allow us to do this. 
that allow us to target the right people, that allow us to only ask people who have used certain features that have the behaviors we're looking for from a wide variety of geographies. Like this is not a hard thing for a product team to do anymore because our tooling is much better than it used to be. I have quite a few questions here from the audience. So I think I'm just going to jump in and ask a couple now because um, yeah, we've never had so many questions to be honest, Teresa. So you've got uh, some, well, hopefully you've got answers for all of these. So um, <laughs> um, questions not specific. Okay, I think this one kind of relates to what we're just talking about. So it's how do you manage skewing assumptions from a few participants uh, without managing a selected sample for confidence in the inside? So I think it's just about like cherry picking and, um, you know, that idea of, you know, if you've only got it, if you're only talking to a few people, I think we kind of covered it, but do you want to just reiterate one more time? Yeah, one of the things that I encourage teams to do is to automate their recruiting process. And like the most common way to do this is to put an ask embedded in your product that says, do you have 20 minutes to talk to us? So there's some bias here. You're only gonna get folks who are willing to opt in, right? But what it does is it removes the internal company bias of I'm gonna just reach out to our happiest customers. I'm gonna just reach out to the customer that my sales rep will let me talk to or that my account rep will let me talk to. It's a little bit more, uh, we can target everybody, we can let some people opt in. Yes, there's a bias and some people won't opt in. We can supplement this later with more with other methods. Um, but I think it really helps with, uh, you have a way of reaching a wide variety of customers and then talking to the folks that are most willing. And here's the deal. We're not talking about skilled interviewers here. I don't want somebody who's not that skilled in interviewing to deal with an unwilling participant. That's a, that's a train wreck, right? So in a lot of ways, we want to set our product teams up for success. I want them talking to willing participants. Again, when we when our teams have a handful of interviews under their belt, now we and they're and they're building habit and they're getting good at it and they're seeing where they still have shortcomings. And especially if they have support of training or like skilled user researchers helping them get good at it. I know not all user researchers want to teach. This is why I teach interviewing. You don't have to teach. Um, uh, we can start to look at how do we introduce this idea of more variation and not fall into this problem of outliers. But you know what I'm going to tell you? Most of the people that opt in are pretty good people to talk to. Like in practice, this is not nearly as big of a problem as it seems. And it's because we're not treating what we learn as truth. We're not. We're, we're treating it as this is Sean's experience. Here's what I learned from Sean. I'm not extrapolating to this is what our customers think. Yeah, I found the same thing actually. Um, that you know the the sort of people who are willing to give you their time and um, talk to you for twenty minutes or half an hour about the product that you're building for them are usually quite passionate about you know the product. And yes, of course, that skews answers. And you're not going to get it. Might be you know survivorship bias. You're not going to get the answer from people who just don't give a crap. But but like to pretend like that's not illuminating um, and that you can't like really get a good insight into the problems you're solving by talking to a passionate person about the product is obviously not true as well. Like you, you're going to get, again, not a perhaps representative view, but you're definitely you're definitely going to get some interesting and uh, useful information out of it. I think that's what you're all about, really. It's a, And I think a lot of people, a lot of purists and people who have like obviously ideological sort of ideas about research, which are correct, I have to sort of, you know, th there is always a place for rigor. And yes, when we're taking a fully scientific approach, we should, you know, a, a, a respect the sort of process and rules around that. Um, however, I sense you're kind of a fan of the Pareto principle, someone who, you know, knows where you can get most of the value from. Is that is that something, is that kind of an outlook you have? I, you know what? I'm really driven by the fact that I just want companies to become more customer centric. That's really at the heart of this. Like I really want companies to build better things for their customers. And if I thought I could say something or write something that would magically convince companies to hire a bunch of use an army of user researchers to go out and do great rigorous research and everybody else in the organization would trust that research and act on it, I would say those things. I don't think there's anything I can say that's gonna make that happen. I don't think there's anything anybody is gonna say in the short term that is gonna make that happen. Just like any profession. I mean, we were here 30 years ago with design. Every profession 
has to mature and get recognition in an organization and the business case needs to be made for it. And we have to get there painfully slowly. And I understand the pain user researchers are going through as a result of this and especially recently. But here's the reality. Until we get to that point, I want to help companies make customer-centric decisions. And part of that solution has to be we already have people in organizations talking to customers all day, every day. Customer success folks, sales folks, support folks, product teams. How do we help them have better conversations? That's my goal. Yeah. And I think um, what you just said then, you know, if we get magic away and make it, make more companies more customer centric and, and, you know, increase research headcount or, you know, however it may be achieved. Uh, I, I think everybody in the in the audience today and potentially everyone in any product team or research org would agree, you know, like that's really the goal. How do we get people to take more notice of insights, use them more, you know, like actually think about the customer when they're building something. And this is really, um, you know, this is the goal that we all have. So hopefully, even if you disagree with Teresa and people in the audience, um, potentially you can see that we're all kind of heading in the same direction. Um, uh, you know yeah. Can I just add to this, like one thing that I see a lot is sometimes people argue, why do product teams move so fast, right? Like, why can't we slow down and do our two weeks of research? Mm -hmm. If we think about the number of decisions we're making on a daily basis in our business across the board, not just your product teams, your finance team, your marketing team, your sales team, your customer success teams, an overwhelming majority of decisions are being made without research. I think most user researchers would argue we're not going to like apply research to 100% of those decisions, right? Some of them are really important decisions and we should take the time to do good research. But I think there's a sliver where we can say, okay, look, you're going to make 100 decisions. 80 of them you're going to make based on the top of your head because it's business and that's how business works. Maybe 10 of them we can do lightweight research activities, research activities by non-researchers. And maybe 10 of them require good research. And what does that do? It gets us 10 more decisions that got some feedback loop in there. That's really where I see the power of this. Yeah, let's exactly. Just, I, I... Let's just get feedback on more decisions. Yes, because you're you're absolutely right. And I think there's a quote I think for some Harvard Business School professor, but it's, you know, that most decisions, in fact, every decision pretty much in business is made with incomplete information. You yeah. know, we, it's just true. It's just the nature of the game. There's too much vari variability out there. There's too many known unknowns and unknown unknowns and whatever it is that Ronsfeld said that time. And it's, uh, <laughs> for those of you old enough in the audience, remember that. <laughs> The, the nature of business is that we're always shooting somewhere in the dark. And if we can just shed some light, if we can illuminate our path just a little bit, we should be really going out of a way to try and do this. And if we can do it in a way that's fast, efficient and effective and, you know, doesn't interrupt the flow of business, because ultimately that's really going to be the name of the game, then we should take those paths. Um, I've got a question here from Sid Chatani. Um, he's asked, uh, I think it's a good question asked this time, which is how do you go about promoting a culture of continuous discovery? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think, uh, so first of all, Marty Kagan's book, Transform, just came out and it's SVPG's view, Silicon Valley Product Group's view of what they see needs to be in place for a successful transformation or adoption of these practices to be in place. Uh, I know not everybody loves Marty Kagan. There's a whole section in this book that I think is spectacular. He talks about you need a C-level executive on board. Your CEO needs to be on board on some level. You need a product leader, on a product executive on board who is willing to coach teams on how to work this way. You probably need a design executive and an engineering executive to be on board. It's really hard, right? Here's what I say to individual contributors. Don't worry about how your organization works. I nice to tell you this from personal experience. I wasted a lot of my full-time employee experience worrying about what everybody else in my organization was doing. And it would have been way smarter to just focus on what I was doing. And I think what people underestimate is they have way more agency to work this way than they realize. Even if you're being asked to deliver a fixed roadmap with fixed dates, you can still do all of the discovery around solutions. You can still talk to customers and figure out how to make those solutions better for the right customers. You can still have an outcome mindset. 
So I think it's really easy to get distracted by nobody else in my organization works this way. They're actively telling me I can't. A lot of this is a way of working, a way of thinking, a way of approaching problem solving. We all individually can control how we solve problems. And I think that's how change happens. I think if we all, I think if every product manager, designer, software engineer, user researcher, list your favorite title, chose to start working this way tomorrow, our organizations would change a lot faster than we think. Okay, so Teresa, I have a lot of questions around this. So uh, when you train teams, you suggest that teams document the outcomes or themes of their conversations. I've got uh, questions about, uh, is there a documentation process? Sorry, that was from uh, Liz Trimba, uh, from Josh, so from Tyler Hale, um, we have the question, uh, what happens after the conversation is over as a documentation process? We've got questions here about uh, tools that you use. Obviously, I'm going to plug Dovetail here. Uh, yeah, how do when multiple teams are doing it for the same product, any recommendations, approaches, and the tools and uh, repository? So obviously, this is a Dovetail webinar. It would be remiss of me not to mention, of course, that Dovetail <laughs> is a research repository. It is exactly a tool you can use for this. Uh, actually, my colleague, Colin, is here, um, and we're going to share a, uh, a series of templates that you can use if you want to. Uh, you can jump in. You can try Dovetail. Uh, free today. Um, you've got discovery templates and you can check it out for yourself as a, as a documentation does, process. Does Dovetail have an interview snapshot template? It it does. It has it. Does. A, it has, yeah, right. yeah. We have, we have uh, interview templates. Um, I don't know if we have one specifically tailored to your approach, though. I think maybe I'll have to talk to you afterwards to get one. Yeah, maybe we'll have to make that happen. Yeah, um, I love but, for, yeah but from a non, non plug perspective, uh, Teresa, what about the documentation question? Yeah, so again, remember, we're not framing these interviews as a research project where we need to keep everything in perpetuity. So one of the things I teach teams is this concept, this concept of continuous synthesis. So we synthesize at multiple levels. Really, we synthesize at the individual level, and then we synthesize two different ways across interviews. So if we start at the individual interview level, I want to see teams capture. First of all, I teach story-based interviewing. Tell me about a time something happened. I then teach them to draw that story. We're basically drawing an experience map of what happened in that story. I do this because for teams that are not trained in synthesis, drawing is a great way to help them see the key moments. Whatever, what actually happened. First A, then B, then C, then D. Second thing we do is we start to look at where was their friction in the story. What, where were their unmet needs? Where were their unmet pain points? Where were their unmet desires? And they come up with a list of opportunities. Now this is specific to that single interview. We're synthesizing one interview. In my book, I introduced an interview snapshot template that just captures this visually. It kind of looks like a persona template, but here's the deal. I don't want non-researchers creating personas. I want them focused on, I talked to Sean. This is Sean's story because I think non-researchers can do that. So then they collect a bunch of these. They've been interviewing for a quarter. Let's say they have 12 of them. Maybe they have 24 of them. They're doing two interviews a week. I actually recommend that after they do three to four interviews, they do their first round of synthesis across interviews. And they do this on two levels. They create an experience map that encompasses everything they heard across those stories. So they have individual experience maps. They can look at the moments in those experience maps and create a super experience map that covers the whole experience. Again, I can teach a non-researcher this because it's a really superficial, here's the key moments in a customer's journey, but it's emerging from real stories. It's not just made up, here's what we thought, right? So then that's one level of synthesis across is what are the key moments across our customer's journeys? And then the second one is what are the common needs, pain points, and desires? that end up on my opportunity solution tree. Again, could there be way more value out of these interviews? Could we get into sentiment analysis? And um, sure, I'm trying to get product teams to look at what is the most actionable things they learned from their interviews. And for a product team, that's gonna be, what's a need I can address? What's a pain point I can address? And what's a desire I can um, address? And then they do that every three or four interviews they continue to update that common experience map and they continue to update their opportunity solution tree. And because they're doing that continuously, they're never stopping and doing theme analysis or affinity mapping. They're never creating a research deck. 
because they don't have a guiding research question. They're just understanding their customer's context. And it's fueling where do we want to play. And they, of course, can combine that with research they're getting from the rest of the organization. Um, I'm going to jump back. Uh, I, lo I love the idea of experience uh, mapping. Uh, and this is something that we discussed last time. Is it is it related? How, or how closely related is it to sort of assumption testing? Yeah, uh, mapping language is so messy. Uh, okay, let me talk about terms. When I say experience mapping, a lot of people might think it's a customer journey map or it might even be a solution story map. Here's how I distinguish between those three things. A story map is, a, is a, an experience map of how somebody is using a product, right? A customer journey map for a lot of companies, they define it as these are all the touch points the customer has with our company whether it's through the product or the success team or the sales team, but it's the customer journey with the whole company. When I say experience map, I'm trying to divorce it from the product or the company. I just wanna learn about Sean, regardless of whether Sean engages with my, my company, whether he uses my product. Now, he opted in through my product, so he probably uses my product, but I want the scope to be about Sean and Sean's needs and not about the product and what you did in my product. So that's why I use the experience map language to try to get product teams to think broader than, hey, look at my shiny solution. It's not about your solution. It's we're here to learn about our customer. Okay. Um, thinking about the interviews, we're still like talking about doing continuous interviews every week um, and you know, synthesizing them sort of en masse every, you know, maybe four or five that you get. Um, and and sort of surfacing those experiences or those kind of like the collective most important nodes on a in a in a kind of experience map. Um, what about prototypes? Should should people bring prototypes to their interviews? Yeah, so this is where we're going to get into assumption testing. So the way that I define interviewing in the like habit sense, I'm looking at that activity with the goal of finding opportunities. Where do I have unmet needs, pain points, and desires? Once we move into evaluating solutions, I wanna get my teams focused on assumptions and testing very specific assumptions. And this is by design because too many teams think about testing ideas from a project mindset. We come up with an idea, we come up with one idea, we prototype the whole idea, which means our designer does all of the design work up front before we get any feedback if we're on the right track. And then we run really long, essentially usability studies to get feedback on, do we build the right thing? And the thing is, a usability study doesn't really test desirability. It certainly doesn't test viability or feasibility or ethical assumptions, right? And so, and then also, I don't wanna do all the design work before I know it's the right solution. And I don't wanna work with one solution at a time. So I encourage product teams to work with multiple ideas that solve the same need. We're setting up a compare and contrast decision. And then we're going to take our ideas and break them down into their underlying assumptions. So this is a common idea because it was popularized by the Lean Startup and David Bland does a ton of work in this space. But I think it's still really misunderstood. Like I hear from product teams every day that say, I don't know how to test my assumption. I go, okay, well, what's your assumption? And they say, my customer will want my solution. Okay, that's not an assumption. I mean, sure, it's an assumption. It's not a testable assumption. The only way to test that is to build it and to see if your customers want it, right? So the underlying, the heart of identifying assumptions is we have to get really specific. Let's say that I, I'm going to use the example I used in my book. We work at Netflix. We're considering adding live sports. Actually, Netflix is now doing this. I feel like my book might have inspired them. Or the millions of sports fans around the world probably inspired them. Right, so we're, we're evaluating, should we, should we um, integrate live sports into our platform? I can generate, first of all, I can generate assumptions just around that opportunity. I wanna watch live sports. Uh, what, what sports should we include? Uh, do they need to be live? Do you wanna watch them on demand? Do you wanna pause and rewind? Do you, right, there's, like there's a hundred million questions that come up as we start to think through a solution. So one of the things that I teach is how do you take an idea, get really specific about what it means, use those specifics to generate underlying assumptions, like actually our subscribers wanna watch sports. They wanna watch sports on our platform. They understand that we offer sports. 
They know how to find sports on our platform. They, we can create a good viewing experience for sports. I know that lots of sports streaming companies create terrible experiences. I'm a hockey fan. It goes into overtime. If you tell me what time the game ended, you just ruined overtime for me. 90% of sports platforms do this. It drives me nuts, right? So there's 100,000 little things in there. These little assumptions, I like to think of them as building blocks that if the wrong one is faulty, the whole solution is gonna fall apart, right? So the value of breaking your solutions down into underlying assumptions is I can test assumptions really quickly. I don't have to do most of the design work. I can just, like if I wanna know, are my subscribers sports fans? I can embed in my product a one question survey that just says, have you watched a sporting event in the last week? Now here's the challenge, and I saw this come up in the chat. The average product manager isn't gonna ask that question. They're gonna ask, do you watch sports? And they're gonna get garbage data because every human has watched a sporting event and every human is gonna say yes, which is why I think we need to train product teams on how to do this well. I'm not suggesting the average Joe Schmo, Schmo is gonna run a good one question survey, but it's not very hard to say, ask about specific behavior in the past and time box it. People can follow these simple rules, right? So I can learn in like an hour or two if I'm Netflix by just embedding on my website, have you watched a sporting event in the last week? And then I like to pair this, I call it a one-two punch. I wanna ask you one question because that's gonna get you to click on it and reply. If it's multiple questions, you're gonna be like, I don't have time for that. But if you say, yes, you watch a sporting event, I'm gonna ask you a second question to get more reliable data. I'm gonna ask you, what was it? And I'm gonna make you fill it in. Now I can evaluate is the sporting event that you watched relevant to what I'm considering in a get creating into my platform. And that yes is a more qualified yes, right? I can do this in an hour or two. I didn't need my designer to prototype the whole solution. And I'm starting to evaluate, is there demand for my solution among my population? Okay. Um, so when it comes to like assumption testing, this fits into continuous interviewing or is it kind of different? Like, do you bring your sort of prototypes to the interviews and you kind of rapidly test them like that? Or is it better to use like more of a, like a quantitative approach or a survey based approach? Do you have any sort of specific opinions on like, like, yeah, what? it kind of depends on what tools you have access to. So I prefer the assumption testing gets a little more quantitative even with prototyping, right? We now have unmoderated testing platforms. I don't love unmod unmoderated testing platforms for like, here's the whole solution. I'm gonna give you a complex task. You're on your own. Hopefully you remember to think out loud. Like that's not the best scenario, right? But if I show you a really simple prototype and I ask you to explain something to me, I can evaluate your understanding. If I give you a micro task, and which is great. Now your video is 10 seconds and I can evaluate results way faster, right? So one of the nice things about assumption testing, smaller tests, simpler tasks. Now we can rely on things like unmoderated testing. I can test with 30 people in, a, in one day. I can go home for the night and come back to 30 results. Um, not everybody has access to these tools. So I might also run my prototype tests in my interviews as I'm doing them because it's opportunistic. But it's really hard if you're doing one interview a week. I don't want you to take 10 weeks to get enough responses to test your assumptions. I'd rather you rely on uh, some of the great tools we have that help us do with this faster. Um, while we're on the topic of prototypes and uh, working with designers, I've got a question here from Josh Bradshaw who says, designers love your book. Yay, it's great. Um, Yay, designers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yet it was originally targeted at product managers. How should designers view uh, continuous discovery habits? How should they view your methodologies? I want to push back on it was originally targeted towards product managers. There you go. There is nothing in my book that targets it. In fact, everything about my book targets it towards product managers, designers, and software engineers. And I'll even share, it's funny that people think I'm a product manager. I was a product manager. I was also a designer. I was also an engineer. I've also done a ton of user research. Uh, so I like to just do whatever's required to build a good product. And I kind of wish more people would embrace that. And then we could stop arguing about titles and roles and who does what. We could just be humans who build things. So the one the one woman product team, I actually did know that you were a designer and, and an engineer. You started off as an engineer, isn't that I, right? I, you... My background is in human-centered design. Right. But I started my career in the 90s when there wasn't a plethora of design jobs. 
So the way that you snuck into a design job was you did front end engineering and did all the design work because there were no designers at most companies. That's right. That's right. Um, so uh, back to assumption testing, just thinking like, um, how do we make decisions based on what we are learning from our assumption tests? Just getting a little bit more into the weeds on that one. Yeah. I'll tell you one of the most common questions I get. And you get this even with prototype testing, right? All right, I talked to five customers. Uh, how do I interpret the results? Is their feedback good enough, right? Um, this is hard. And it's because we fall into the trap of testing one idea at a time. So I show you a prototype. Maybe you love it, but I don't know if you're really gonna use it. I, I mean, hopefully I designed it in a way where I'm evaluating your behavior and not what you think you'll do. Um, but even so, right? Like it's really hard when we work with one idea at a time to evaluate, is this good enough? And this is part of the reason why it's really important that product teams compare and contrast solutions. I mean, designers know this, right? Every designer on the planet knows to provide multiple options, not just one. It's the same idea. At decision-making research, like we know this, we know the more options we consider, the better decision we make. So one of the ways that we can make decisions on our assumption tests is we're gonna test assumptions across multiple ideas and we're gonna evaluate the results. And sometimes the results across all three ideas are terrible and we decide to throw all our ideas away and start over. Sometimes they're very muddled and it doesn't look like we have a clear winner. In my book, that means our ideas are terrible and you should throw them away and start over. Sometimes we get a clear front runner and it's clear one idea is qualitatively better than the other ideas. That's a good thing. That tells us let's go in this direction, right? So it's really hard to evaluate assumption tests and to make decisions on assumption tests if we're working with one idea at a time. It is, we're learning relative feedback. We have to compare and contrast. And we're never gonna remove judgment from the process. We still have to make the best decision we can with imperfect data. Um, I'm just gonna use this opportunity now. We've got, like a, we've got still like plenty of time left for questions and stuff, but I wanted to just give a quick shout out to um, <laughs> a conference that is coming in a few weeks. So if you do love, uh, if you like conversations like this with, with fascinating people with great, great insights, you will love Inside Out. Uh, we're currently giving away some tickets as well. Uh, we have a competition going on our LinkedIn. All you have to do is answer the question on our LinkedIn um, and register for the free Inside Out uh, webinar or so a hybrid uh, event. So if you register for that and answer the question, you will go into the draw to win a ticket to the conference in San Francisco. So it is in San Francisco though. So you kind of have to be in that area if you want to go. Um, but yeah, jump, jump in. Um, and like I said, the the online version is completely free, so you can stream all the great talks that are going to go on on like April 11 on that day. Um, back to your rescheduled programming. Um, I just want to know about like, so we've talked about assumption testing and we've talked about uh, continuous interviewing. Like, how do you know when to use what? Like, and I think just bringing it all together and showing our audience like, you know, where it begins and where those two things kind of really fit in would really help, I think. Yeah, I'll kind of give my ideal timeline for a team. Before I get into the details, I want to give a shout out to table-based layouts because that came up in the chat and now I'm squarely thinking about Internet Explorer 5. So thank you for that. Uh, okay, so maybe even Internet Explorer 4. Oh, I don't miss those days. Um, okay, <laughs> that was like 20 plus years ago and I still feel like I have a little bit of like <laughs> in my brain. Um Let's talk about like, what does this look like in practice? Let's say it's the beginning of a quarter. You're on a cross-functional product team. You have a new outcome. Now what? Okay, the first thing I like to do is I like, if I'm on a brand new outcome for the first time, I wanna front load my interviews. I wanna get to that three or four interviews as quickly as possible so that I can start doing my across the interview synthesis. So in week one, I'm probably doing three to four interviews. By the end of week one, I have my first draft of a common experience map and my first draft of the opportunity space. I, I'm gonna tell you one of the phrases I use a lot in all of our courses is crummy first draft. I see teams spin their wheels on this. Just get to a crummy first draft. And the reason why I want you to do a crummy first draft, you're gonna revisit it every three or four weeks. It's gonna continue to evolve. They're both intended to be living documents and I don't want you doing generative research indefinitely. 
we're product teams. Our job is to ship solutions. So by the end of week one, I want the team choosing a target opportunity and starting to explore solutions. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. They're like, we barely know anything. Yeah, but last quarter, you just built whatever you thought you should build with no input. So now it's the new quarter. By the end of week one, three to four interviews, a draft of your experience map, a draft of your opportunity space, choose a target opportunity. In week two, you're brainstorming ideas, you're story mapping them, you're identifying assumptions, and you're launching assumption tests. And here's why it's critical that it happened this quickly. By the way, in week two, you're also interviewing. You're doing another interview. The reason why it's critical it moves this fast. If you take three or four weeks to interview and map your opportunity space and you haven't chosen a target opportunity and your stakeholders come to you and say, how's the quarter going? How are you doing on your outcome? For a whole month, you're saying, I don't know yet. That is not gonna fly, right? So we have to be pushing towards solutions. Now here's the deal. You're probably gonna pick the wrong target opportunity in week two. You're probably gonna explore pretty crummy solutions. You're not gonna be very good at assumption testing. That's okay, you're still better than you were last quarter when you were just pulling things off the top of your head. So you build some things. They're probably the wrong things, but at least you built something. You can show progress. You have something to tell your stakeholders who are way too delivery focused, and then you do it again. And you're continuing to interview. So you're continuing to learn more about your customers. You're continuing to learn about more opportunities. So the second time you choose a target opportunity, it's gonna be a little better, right? So people get caught up on perfect cycles. And I get, I, I will tell you, I'm gonna say this and a hundred people on LinkedIn are gonna be like, Teresa said, move fast and break things and build whatever you want. That's not what I'm saying. We have to move fast because our organization expects us to. That is the truth. We have to move fast because our organization expects us to. When we slow down, we lose the right to do any discovery at all. Everybody loses. The business loses. The team loses. Customers lose. We have to move fast to earn the right to keep doing discovery. So I think people should push the pace. You're interviewing every week. Every single week, you should be evaluating a set of solutions, deciding the best option to build. With every cycle, you will get better and better at it. Your knowledge bank will grow. You'll get better at running assumption tests. The bets you make in your bet backlog will get stronger and stronger. That's it. Ever the product coach, you know, that's it, folks. Get out, get on the court and hustle. Uh, it's all about it's. And I, I mean, your book is called Continuous Discovery Habits for a reason. Yeah. It's really something about building that habit, building that muscle and getting improving over time, not perfection, but getting better. And I, I really love that. Um, so I've got I, I want to get through as many of these questions as possible from our audience. Um, so I'm just going to I'm going to fire through them and let's and see see how we go. Yeah. Um, so if the CEO isn't on board and another uh, C level exec isn't on board for advocating and being hands on, should you try and get them on board or just seek out other opportunities? Neither. I don't think either of those is the right answer. Focus on your own individual habits. I will share. I've never worked at a company where the CEO is like, "Oh, we should do continuous discovery." I've also never worked at a company where I didn't do continuous discovery. Just focus on your own habits. Uh, how is the continuous discovery approach different from having stakeholders, PMs, devs, et cetera, observe interviews conducted by UXRs on a regular basis? So this is kind of contrasting with Jared Spool's kind of exposure uh, approach, uh, Teresa. Yeah, I like this as a stepping stone. Like if you have an organization where the culture is, we really want everything done by user researchers, I think that's fine as a stepping stone. I think what you're going to find really quickly is your product teams are gonna watch those interviews and they're gonna have a million questions. And if you can't help them get answers to those million questions, they're gonna stop trusting your research. So I think like if you wanna like show what a good interview looks like, if you wanna get everybody involved, if you wanna build excitement about working this way, I think that's a great first step. But you're opening a can of worms. When we see an interview, we have 100,000 more questions. And if they're not gonna get answers to those 100,000 more questions, they're gonna stop watching your interviews. Uh, those last questions from Randy Samalia and Salil RS, respectively. So shout out to you guys. Thank you very much. Um, so a uh, question from Greg Lassell about uh, experience maps. Uh, is it multiple experience maps for each research conversation? At what point do you tie it all together and find patterns? And then how frequently are you updating it? 
Yeah, so remember we talked about two levels of synthesis. The first level is I'm just synthesizing what did I learn from my conversation with Sean. If I I want to see a team collect one good detailed story in an interview, that means I have one experience map. Now, what inevitably happens is teams aren't that good at collecting stories. They've got 20 minutes, they spent seven minutes, and they have 13 minutes left. They collect a second story, in which case they would do a second experience map. Now, across interviews, I'm doing this every three or four interviews. So if I'm doing one a week, it's every three or four weeks. If I'm doing two a week, it's every other week. And I'm starting to look at what are the common moments across these stories? What's my common experience map? From, um, thank you for thank you for the answer. From anonymous attendee, um, are you creating hypotheses when testing assumptions or are these more generic research questions? Very sort of technical question here. Um, what's, what's your response? I used to use the term hypothesis. In fact, if you search product talk for hypothesis, you'll find it used quite a bit. I stopped using it when I wrote the book. And this is because what I see so every user researcher will relate to this. And I'm sorry, I use the term user researcher. I know UX researcher is now the term of the day. It's just old habits, die hard. Um, okay, so every researcher has experienced this. You present your research. Somebody disagrees with the findings. What do they do? They nitpick the methods. Every time, right? You didn't talk to the right people. You didn't talk to enough people. I think you asked the wrong question because we don't believe research we don't agree with. That's just the reality. Every human is this way. Um, when we use the term experiment, when we use the term hypothesis, we're setting a standard that we're following the scientific method, we're doing double blind randomized controlled studies, we're opening the door to I don't have to believe a thing you learned because you didn't do that level of experiment. That is not the goal with assumption testing. We're not proving anything, we're not scientists, we don't have time for real science. We do care about methods, absolutely we care about methods, but we're trying to collect signals. Are we on the right path? Does this solution look better than this solution? And so I find that just talking about assumptions and trying to collect some data about, does this assumption look faulty or not? I'm not proving it. I'm not disproving it. I'm not validating it. I'm not invalidating it. I'm just looking at, is there evidence out there that could help me inform my decision? That's it, real light. And I think that's really important because when we talk about experiments and we talk about hypotheses, we start getting, well, I don't like your methods. Okay, well, you made 17 decisions today with no evidence. Can I talk about your methods? Right? And so I think that's where um, language really matters. So I try not to use the term hypothesis at all. Uh, in a related note uh, from Cat Fox, and I've, there's a lot of questions about, you know, sort of bias. Um, how do you, like, how do you avoid bias? Um, or is it even something that we can avoid? I mean, that's like a big philosophical question. Uh, I don't think we can avoid bias 100%. Like if I start at the highest philosophical level, I don't think we could avoid bias 100%. I think like if we go back to like the 1990s and the early 2000s and best practices, we used to say things like, we need a researcher to run a usability test because the designer will be biased in interpreting the results of their own design. I think that's true. I see this a lot. I see product teams fall in love with their idea. They do research. They're literally looking to validate that they were right. They don't have a lot of intellectual honesty. They're not approaching their research from a good standpoint. That's not what I'm talking about here, right? I think if a team builds the muscle of, it's not about my idea versus your idea. It's not about this is the one best idea. It's about how do we get a signal that we're going in the right direction? And one of the things that I think really helps this is a lot of teams hyper-focus on their first idea. I make them generate 20 ideas because I wanna break their fixation on a single good idea. I want dozens of good ideas. When we get to that level, we start to let go of like, well, this was my idea and that's your idea and this has to be the way to do it. And I think that's where a lot of the bias in research comes from as we just overcommit. So I like to break the overcommit. So uh, we're about out time here, but I, Lucy Serrett uh, has commented, um, ah, I love this, so many truth bombs, and I can absolutely agree. I think this is one of the uh, best conversations I've had on, on these webinars, and this is my second time talking to you, Teresa.
And uh, that's the same impression every time. It is a lot of truth bombs. It's a lot of people, a lot of pragmatism, a lot of just this is the way it is. And this is how we're going to get better uh, talk. Yes. So if everyone can give uh, a digital round of applause for Teresa Torres, I'm sorry we couldn't get around to all the questions that were asked. Um, and I know that you have so many, uh, you've asked so many great questions. So it is unfortunate. But, you know, I, I uh, you know, maybe we'll try to get Teresa around another time because honestly, yeah. this was a great conversation and we've, uh, everyone has uh, clearly enjoyed it. So uh, thank you again. Um, again, we've, um, you know, there's Inside Out coming, all the all the regular plugs. Honestly, really, I'm just stoked to have had this great conversation. And, and also the audience, you guys have been absolutely fantastic. So many awesome questions, such great engagement. So yes, until uh, we'll wrap it up now, but until next time, see you later. Thank you. Thank you, I Teresa. love all the reactions. I feel a little beat up recently by UX researchers. And it's nice to see that not everybody is in that camp. So thank no, you. I really appreciate not. it. Absolute super fans over here. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next time. Ciao.